Welcome to Toastmaster Time, the television show that has everybody talking. I'm Ashley Harkness. I'm the host for this episode of Toastmaster Time. And with me is our evaluator for the evening, Seema Geary. Seema, tell us about the lineup for our show tonight. Thank you, Ashley. We have a special treat from, from the Club Warehouse Toastmasters Club. We have three amazing, exceptional speakers, and we'll be learning not only a, some life lessons, but great examples of how to up-level our own speeches. Back to you, Ashley. Oh, that sounds very, very good, Seema. Thank you. And it's good to be working with you again. I'll see you at, uh, later in the show. So for our first presenter, I have with me Laura Paradise. Laura, welcome to Toastmaster Time. How long have you been at Toastmasters? Five years. Five years. And has Toastmasters helped you in the work you do? Toastmasters has been instrumental in helping me to build my career coaching business. It's helped me with promoting, with training, and with developing a program to help people build interview skills. Uh, has it helped you with your confidence in front of people, people speaking? I feel like I can stand in front of any audience and win them over. Excellent, because you're going to be standing in front of our audience in a minute to give your speech. Are you ready? Yes. Okay, that's good. Well, I'll give you a second as you get going over there to your mark, and uh, I'll be talking to the people at home. And we'll have uh, our speaker here in a second. Our speaker is Laura Paradise. She has got a project, the purpose of which is to introduce her, your, herself and the aspects of her interests. So please welcome Laura Paradise. She will never have enough. She will never have enough. Laura Paradise. How can you really know someone? I go inside my mother's home to learn more about her. She's a writer, a reader, a dancer, a cook, a bird watcher, an artist, a Jew, a Holocaust survivor. At six years old, my mother and her family fled from Vienna. They could only take one suitcase each and had days to pack. My Omama sold a beautiful gold bracelet into her heavy wool coat. Some people were killed for taking too much. At 87 years old, my mother lives alone. Her house is full, full of bags and bags of bags inside bags and bags coffee cups, paper clips, buttons, pens, pencils, and scraps of paper with the names of people she has met scrawled inside. She is always hungry. My brother cleans out her refrigerator. He finds 317 pieces of croissant inside. We laugh. We imagine our mother on her lonely visits to the cafe each day, getting treats and nibbling around the edges. She takes the remnants home. She can't waste anything. Her refrigerator is full. It's full of leftovers from meals months ago. It's full of apples and oranges, specialized nuts and treats, cheeses, jams, pickles. It's like a sardine can. It's so full. My mother is always cold. She lives just an hour away and comes to visit me for the weekend. She comes with five bags packed full, towels, blankets, sweaters, coats, and of course a grocery bag packed full. Still, she asks me, Laura, can I borrow a sweater? I just don't have the right thing to wear. My cousin and I used to tease each other how many blue t-shirts does your mother have? Our refugee mothers can't resist the cashmere sweaters and t-shirts at rummage sale prices. We count at least six t blue t-shirts each. Sometimes I play a game with my mother. I steal something. Maybe it has the tag on it still. Oh, my mother says, that's a beautiful shirt. Where did you get it? I'd love to have one just like that. Can I borrow it? Her closets are packed full and brimming. When I open the door, things tumble out. I wonder how she can find anything. She says she never has enough. At Passover, the Jews remember their exodus from Egypt. 
We eat matzah, unleavened bread, to remember that the dough didn't have time to rise. And we ask ourselves, if you just had a few hours to pack and were fleeing your home, what would you take with you? For my Omama, it was a warm sweater for her child and a gold bracelet to remember her beautiful Vienna home. For my Omama, being together was enough. For my six-year-old mother, there is not enough. And there was not enough time in her elementary school. There was not a time, enough time with her dolls, not enough time in the plaza, not enough time knowing she was warm or safe or settled. My mother is always cold. She is always hungry. She is always looking for something more. She is a refugee. Open the door and you will see for yourself. Seema, you're the evaluator. Tell us what you thought of Laura's speech. Thank you, Ashley. Laura's speech was very heartfelt and touching. She was able to really let us know about her mother through the different stories that she, was, uh, she had laid out. It's amazing to see how your whole life can be run based on your childhood experiences. She really structured her speech really well. It was very easy to follow. It was very simple and very engaging. One suggestion I would have, and when you come here and you have a small space, it's a little bit difficult to do, but I think she could really have used the space a little bit more to really get her points across. Back to you, Ashley. Thank you, Seema. Those are very good suggestions. I'm sure she will grow quite a bit from that. Now, with me at the table, please help me welcome Susie Weishak. Susie, how long have you been in Toastmaster? I first joined 12 years ago, dropped out, joined again, okay. and lately I have been in Warehouse Toastmasters for three years. Excellent. Very, very good. Well, how has Toastmasters helped you in the work you do? The most lasting effect that I've had since the beginning has been the ability to speak on the spot. And I love speaking to strangers mm -hmm. and the inspiring people to engage in conversation in the wild. That's what I love. Mm -hmm. So you are doing a lot of impromptu speaking, I would imagine. I am. Do you enjoy that? I adore it. Oh, excellent. Are you ready to do your presentation for us tonight? I hope so. Okay, good. Well, <laughs> I'll give you a couple of moments to get over to your spot on the floor. And while that is going on, I'll talk to the audience about the speech. Thank you very much. Uh, Susie's speech is a, has a purpose. It is to share some aspect of her experience of recording her thoughts and feelings. So uh, she will be giving a presentation. Uh, the, yeah, so please help me welcome Susie Wyshak. The Joy of Stuff, The Joy of Stuff, Susie Wyshak. Joy. Joy to the world. I'm full of joy. Who doesn't want to be joyous? My mother was possibly one of the most abundantly joyful people I have ever met. And when it came time for her to downsize, she passed her joy on to me in the form of two 16-foot trucks that landed at my house. I am abundantly overflowing with joy. And if you're familiar with Marie Kondo, the goddess of tidying, the woman with the Netflix series that follows people as they try to declutter and try to downsize, you might know that joy is a word I use facetiously. Because the joy that my mother found in statues and books, the world's books, just like Amazon, only in our house, in masks, in all the photos from our childhood, our childhood art, papers, newspapers, funny papers dating back decades. All of that brought her joy and landed in my house. You might think, if you have not yet inherited, 
a huge load of things from generations of your family that you could say, that's just not realistic. You can't keep that stuff. Well, my mom was a lawyer and she was very persuasive and I was a good girl. Now she is no longer with us and I am full of her joy. What I would like to share with you though is what I have learned through the process of trying to reclaim my space and happiness in my own life and joy the way I see it. I had bought Marie Kondo's book and gone through the process of tidying my own things. What she suggests is you take what is the least emotionally important, that kitchen junk drawer, empty it out, pick up every item and say, does this bring me joy? If not, send it off to the next place. The thing is, it's easy to do that with your own things, but when it comes to inheriting all of these things you might have grown up with that were so important to your loved ones, they're not there to tell you what's important or what's meaningful. And every time you let something go, you're letting a piece of them go. It has been a long process. And I've learned it helps me process my grief. What I've done is find a way to create meaning in getting rid of all this stuff. I'm losing potential rent. I told my mom that. It's, it landed in all the rooms of my house. And she said, you're lucky to have all that. Anyway, most importantly, I would like to share with you how I've created this meaning and how you can do so too. As practically everyone I speak with has said, oh yeah, I have this stuff that's coming to me and I need to know what to do. The key is resell, regift, repurpose. You might not have the time to go through that process. You might bring in someone to do an estate sale. But I really suggest trying it out. For example, when you resell, there's the online marketplaces, the eBay, the Etsy, Craigslist, Nextdoor, Facebook. There's unlimited online ways and apps to get rid of things. What I have done is make connections with people who either know about the precious objects, the baby carrier from Borneo, the clay object from the Native Americans. And I've spoken to archeologists and strange museums from across the world, people who are excited about these things. And I've created stories I can share with my friends. There's the re-gifting. I've donated thousands of books to the Prison Literacy Project, clothing to colleges, and then repurposing as I narrow down the stuff in the house. I look up and I see glasses with hand painted with gold. I don't want to use them. I can't put them in the dishwasher. Those are now in my medicine cabinet. Then when you become loaded with someone else's belongings, think about yourself. It's your joy that matters. Think about meaning that you can bring as you go through that process. And most importantly, process your grief as you process these things and reclaim your joy. Thank you, Susie. Now we'll have an evaluation by our evaluator, Seema Giri. Giri. Seema, what did you think of the, the presentation? Thank you, Ashley. Another exceptional speech. Very relatable. I just experienced the same thing a couple of years ago. What I liked about Susie's speech was that it was she gave very practical tips, the three R's, resell, regift, and repurpose, and reminded how, how you can get reclaim your own joy and not forget yourself in this whole process. 
Again, it was very well structured, very well laid out, very simple to understand. Uh, again, the same suggestion, use the space a little bit more to really hone in on your points that um, you want to make. Other than that, it was an amazing, heartfelt story. Back to you, Ashley. Thank you, Seema. Very good evaluation. I'm sure she'll get a lot of benefit out of that. Thank you very much. Here at the table with me is Miguel Magana. Welcome to Toastmaster time. Thank you, it's a pleasure. So uh, Miguel, how long have you been in Toastmasters? I actually started in 2014 in prison. They had uh, Toastmasters in prison. Okay. And I just came out in 2018 and joined in. Well, tell us, how has Toastmasters helped you in your life? Man, it's practice. It's different to perform than to talk, casual. So it's just like nonstop practice of performing, performing. You get to see performers. It's yes. Great. I have had the same experience. That's very, very good. Mm -hmm. Now, you joined Warehouse Toastmasters. Uh, what kind of a club is that? It's uh, phenomenal. I'll say the best, the best thing about Warehouse is this diversity. Diversity in race and age and culture and way of speaking. And it's just phenomenal to see uh, week by week. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Are you ready to do your speech? Absolutely. Okay, well, I'll give you a couple minutes to get over there. And while you're uh, discussing that, I will tell the audience a little bit more about your presentation. Uh, Miguel will be giving a, a speech, the purpose of which is to use a story within a speech. And he will be doing uh, motivational strategies, which is a path. So please help me welcome Miguel Magana, nothing, something. Nothing, something, Miguel Magana. I was 20 years old in prison, and I would tell other prisoners, hey man, what'd you think about the Rumi quote? He said, you were born with wings. Why well, prefer to crawl? And they would say nothing. Mahatma Gandhi said, you must be the change you want to see in the world. They would say nothing. Man, I just saw the most beautiful woman in the world. Really, what was her name? Maya Angelou. I mean, when you see this woman, she's just love. They would say nothing. Yo, you want to learn German? Nothing. Bisogna parlare l'italiani? Nothing. Man, I really don't relate to people. I may live in a forest and shave off my head and become a monk. They would say nothing. I was 20 years old in prison, 20 years old, naive enough to let the nothings hurt me. Nothing, nothing, nothing felt like a door slam, a door slam, a door slam. And I felt like I was in Dracula's lair and everywhere around me, it felt like life was just taken from me. Now I'm 20 years old in prison. In prison, there's luxuries that you could buy. Your family could send you some money, your families and friends, and you could buy um, CD players, you could buy TVs, you could buy books, you could buy food, you could buy all types of stuff. My family was struggling, so I didn't want to ask them for money. So what I did, I hustled. Hustles. Hustled mean drawing, doing poetry, teaching people how to box, protecting people, and sometimes making food. Now, I hustled. And when you hustle, you have to maintain your reputation. You have to maintain respect, because if people don't respect you, they're not going to pay you. And if they don't pay you, that's just not good for business. Now, there's this guy who had owed me money for a couple of weeks. This guy was mid-30s, you know, big Mexican guy, tattoos everywhere, big old mustache. And every time I'd ask this guy for the money, he'd say, hey, man, I got you next week, fool. <sighs> next week. Hey, man, do you have that? Oh, I got you next week, fool. Next week. Hey, man, do you have that? Oh, I got you next week, fool. Hey, uh, do you have that? Next week. I got you next week. Hey, listen, man, if you're not going to pay me my money, tell me like a oh, man, you're not going to pay me. That way I'm not chasing you. This guy looks at me. He turns his neck. He squints his eyes. He gets off his bed. My heart starts beating. He puts on his boots. My heart starts beating. He rushes towards me. He comes right here. He said, what'd you say, homie? My heart starts beating. I'm from Oakland. We don't say the word homie. So that word unsettled me. He's in my face. What'd you say, homie? Now, this guy didn't know that I've been boxing since the age of 18. This guy didn't know that I was really, really good. This guy did not know that I was an aspiring Olympic. He's this close to me. My heart's really beating. Now, I F that, homie. What'd you say? And in that moment, 
10 generations of my father's side and 10 generations of my mother's side join my right hand and I just hit this guy in the chin. And he hit the ground and went unconscious. My heart starts beating. I was 20 years old in prison. He wakes up 20 seconds later and I leave the room. And in prison, prisoners have this sixth sense where they can just sense violence or negativity. So when I left the room, I was met by a crowd of people. A crowd of people that praised me for what I'd done. There was a lot of oohs, there was a lot of ahs, there was a lot of praise. We knew you had it in you, Miguel. As I walked away, feeling so ashamed, so betrayed because I had violated myself, I had become what I had feared the most. And I walked away. I got out seven years later, and I came out. And I came out to what I believe would be a different type of people, people who would aspire to do different, people who aspired uh, for knowledge, for justice, for humanity. And I felt so betrayed when I came out because I didn't find that. I, find, I found out that people in prison are somewhat similar to people outside because when I tell them my prison stories, there's a lot of oohs, there's a lot of ahs. And when I tell them about my suffering, about my discipline, about my love, there's hardly anything. But when you talk to me, and you tell me about suffering, you tell me about discipline, you tell me about how much you love someone, there will be something. There will be a lot of love and reciprocation. You talk to me about gore and about violence, and there will be nothing. Powerful, powerful story. Powerful story. Seema, your evaluation. Ashley, I'm actually speechless. That was an amazing, powerful story. And it didn't even sound like a speech. It sounded like a poem. Well, he was telling us a story. And a poet, <laughs> a poet. I hear the poetry. Yes, absolutely. Yes, very well structured. I mean, he met his objective of storytelling within the speech very well structured, it was very relatable, very easy to follow. I could feel my heart beating when he was saying that his heart was beating. I could see the other guy right in front of my face um, as he was sharing that. It was just, he took you right there. I don't think I want to visit Warehouse Toastmasters to see him speak I, again. I you know. know. That'd be good. We were, we were very fortunate. We had three very good speakers tonight uh, on, this, on the program, and I feel very honored that we had this opportunity to hear their speeches. Uh, Laura with her story about her mother and being uh, caught in the Holocaust, and Susie when she was dealing with someone who has a lot of stuff because mm -hmm. they have a lot of stuff. And here we have a person who shares something very important in their life that a lot of people may ooh and ah about, but I think they walk away as a different cha changed person. What do you think about that? I, th I agree with you 100%. Each, what makes a really great speech is your personal story. Mm -hmm. And if you can eloquently tell your personal story, your audience, not only will they be engaged, but they will learn so much about how to handle life and how to go, you know, get wisdom from from their experiences. It was just amazing. I mean, I. How often do you run into someone who's experienced Holocaust? I mean, Laura has seen that through her mother's eyes, and same with uh, Susie. So much wisdom from each one of their speeches. It's. It's just amazing. It is amazing, and, and it's amazing that in, in Toastmasters we have this opportunity to experience learning how to give stories. We can reach into our own past, into the past of our uh, relatives and associates, and come up with something that is a message for everybody else. The messages I heard tonight were a message of hope, but also a message of survival, and another person who says, you know, I'm a lot more than what you see on the outside. I'm a lot more, and yet Tomorrow is another day, and I'm going to be even more for that. Uh, this is a part of Toastmasters, and I think we don't often see it, but tonight we've got a lot of great chance at this. So you are doing evaluations on the uh, speakers. Your evaluations uh, had some recommendations. Overall, would you have a recommendation for our speakers in total? 
it's, it's extremely difficult to say that because people that come to Toastmasters Time TV, they are exceptional speakers. Mm -hmm. um, I would say one theme that I saw for all of them was the use of stage. That's one, one tool that they have that we forget, especially when we're in a small location. But you can still use a stage to show different time periods and different points. Um, Miguel did turn, which it really looked like there were three, four people in the room with him there, which, is, um, which was interesting. So it really engages the audience quite a bit. That was a central theme that I saw. I see. Bringing in the, the people who aren't there by changing your, your position in your speaking spot is very effective for that. In Miguel's sense, he was telling us the comparison of what was happening on one side and the other yes. and giving us a great chance to see really what was going on with that. I'm afraid that uh, I have yet to, to really put it all together. I, probably after the show, I'm going to talk to Miguel a little bit about that because I can sense where it's going. And plus, I've known people who've been through the Holocaust and others who've had older uh, relatives. Uh, this is the human condition that we're dealing with. And it's a great opportunity to have that. What will you take away from tonight's show, personally? Ashley, you're asking very interesting questions. It's really making me go deep and think. But one thing that I take away is just to be authentically you. Each one of them were, were being authentically themselves and sharing parts of themselves that maybe an ordinary person may think twice about. And I thought that was really important. We really got, in just six minutes, we got to know exactly who they are at the core. I think the key with what you said was authenticity. Uh, we're seeing real people with real things really happening. Oh, I think that's a real big deal. Well, thank you very much for being on as evaluator. It's time for us to say goodbye to our studio audience. This is Ashley Harkness with evaluator Seema Geary and the crew and the gear, uh, people who are putting the show together at the Media Center in Palo Alto. We want to thank everybody for that. If you're interested in finding out more about Toastmasters, we're here for you. The easiest way is to go to the website d57tm.org, find out about District 57 and all of the activities that are going on. We have quite a bit of wonderful stuff happening. And if you're interested in Toastmasters overall, go to toastmasters.org. You'll find the whole scheme there. Toastmasters are everywhere in the world, and I would say that you can't go wrong by visiting a Toastmaster club. So for all of the people here, the speakers, the evaluators, and the crew, I want to thank you all for coming to us. And with that, I want to say go well and come back because at Toastmaster time, we have everybody talking.